Welcome to The Juice. My name is Drew McDougall, and I will be hosting the show for you. This brings me to the pop culture section of the show. I recently watched a film entitled Knock Down the House. This film is about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. The movie is about her run for U.S. Congress. This is a huge step forward in uh, the women's movement, and I believe she was the youngest female to ever win a spot on the U.S. Congress. This is a huge win for her and the Democrats, and I'm really proud of her. The movie was mostly about her campaign against Joe Crowley who is her political opponent and who is competing for the same spot in Congress. Majority of the film was the campaign. You got, it was neat to get up close and personal um, as we get to see behind her life. Um, you really get to know Alexandria and the sort of life she comes from and her background. Uh, you get to see her work experience, s sort of a middle-class struggle, and her uh, fight to win her spot. I'm really impressed by her win, and she's actually just three years older than me, which makes me feel like I should run for senate if you're into politics i definitely suggest giving this film a watch obviously it's political given it's a campaign film but alexandria cortez's story is uh an interesting story to say the least i found her film to be very inspirational commend her on her journeys as a congresswoman i think her win is a huge victory for the women's march I can relate to her middle class struggle and the over domination of older white men in politics. It's fascinating to see someone finally win a spot that isn't an older white male. I think it's actually very refreshing and I think diversity has a health factor and I think society actually functions better when there's more diversity. Once again, I'm just way stoked for her. I went and visited with a good friend, Jamie Schuster. He's a musician and he hosted a jam set. We were able to maintain safe distances while wearing masks and we had a great time. It was a jam session, so there's a lot of music and We'll, we'll get to see a bit of it here in a minute. The song is called Archie Marry Me by Always. Sweet. It's, it's a really cool band. Dedicated to Carly. <laughs> Dedicated to Carly, I guess. You ready? One, two, three, four.
For this week's section of the show on art, we took a tour of Crush Walls with a good friend, Jeffrey. We toured Rhino, checked out majority of the Crush Walls event, obviously following the state uh, social distancing order and mask mandate. It was a meetup of street artists who were commissioned to paint walls around uh, the River North Arts District area in downtown Denver. The event draws a huge crowd and a whole bunch of attention. Obviously, if you've seen the last few episodes, I've been segmenting street art and Jeffrey's actually been giving me some good tips about street art. The Crush Walls event happens every year and I look forward to it next year. All three of these pieces are new this year, uh, or replaced, so you'll see a lot of artwork that lasts one year, or e sometimes even less. Um, Greg Deal, he's a Pyramid uh, Lake Paiute tribe, uh, that's northeast of Reno, a uh, location of contemporary artists, he challenges western perception of indigenous people, touching on issues of race, history, stereo and stereotypes. Um, he is a multimedia artist. His work includes paintings, murals, performance art, filmmaking, and spoken word. He tells stories of decolonialization, decolonization, and appropriation that affect Indian country. Um, this is a great example of that. I'll uh, give you a chance to read while I'm also speaking at you. Um, is, he's heavily involved in the activist movement, the hashtag change the name. Um, a lot of prominence this year with the uh, now the Washington football team, I believe is the actual name. He's appeared on The Daily Show and Totally Biased with Kamau Bell, among other appearances on TV, so that's pretty cool. I don't remember him on Great Deal, but I guess he's on there. Um, replaced one of my very favorite, it was a buffalo, the blue buffalo with the red sun and the, um, and the background. So it was, it was a super awesome one. You can see photos of that somewhere. Their texture. So um, it is a collab between the two of them, and um, they focus on wheat case installations, photo prints, textiles, samples, etc. So this, you get a lot of geometry here. Um, there, it, this is a wheat case in there. And we're going to jog 10 to 30 yards this way. So Patrick Maxey is uh, he's a painter, muralist, adventurer, humanitarian. He highlights nature in his stories he tells and aims to spark conversation. Um, disappearing nature and encroachment of the modern world, the subjects in the surroundings depicted in harmony and in balance that they wouldn't normally interact with. I think the coffee cup and the, the octopus taking a ride on the whale is a great example of this. Uh, his work can be found throughout North America, South America, and Africa. Um, and you'll notice um, some of the, the Instagram tags down there. Um, so we're gonna actually back work which way we go at Seismar. Um, and um, there's a bunch of artwork on this alley. We'll just focus on this one, then we'll pop back down to the left. Um, Caitlin Oren is um, she's an artist and amateur drag racer out of Denver. Her background is graphic design and illustration. Um, and but she's been focusing her work on fine art and lettering. So the lettering here. I think largely her contribution to the work. Um, Caitlin Seismer, uh, she's a fine art painter, illustrator, and muralist out of Denver. She's um, been featured in numerous exhibits around Denver and the country. Uh, and brightly colored copy paintings that typically combine human and natural elements with flashes of nostalgia. So we're uh, seeing that here. Um, I chatted with them very briefly and while they were working and I uh, uh, I forgot the name that they were trying to get, they were thinking of um, titling this. It's something about challenging the normal or whatever. I don't know. Um, a lot of these things are kind of here. I want to work with the title. So, um, we move on to the West. St. Block on, on Lake, um, kind of northeast facing, was a collaboration including Pat Milbury. He's a, he's a top uh, street muralist here. A lot of big walls. We need to do I've seen or definitely familiar with, we, uh, we love the city, right? We love the city. That's at um, Broadway at Arapahoe, um, and that was commissioned by like Visit Denver or something. Um, he's done a lot of collaborations. He also works out of the Blue Building at Lake 
and 28th, the corner there. It's still not dem demolished to build the five stories of condos yet, so thank goodness. Um, anyway, uh, and then also when we pass, when we go into Erico Motorsports, everyone noticed the Evo Knievel on the left, Bulldog. right? Huge wall this size uh, with Boog, Boog, the dog. So this, so it's a uh, happy for greater pain. This is good work. Huge, beautiful piece. It actually has some, um, really has a lot of like, what looks like detours work or coloration. And we'll see a detour piece um, just around the corner. Detour is not evident. We'll chat with him a little bit more. Uh, but but Kane has unfortunately lost his his beloved um, American pit bull. I don't know, British pit bull. This dog. And but he will appear and lives on in many of his artwork. He also had a piece for like a month on Larimer Lounge or the kitchen, Metal Art Kitchen. One of the one of the windows is an awesome piece that thankfully I snapped the photo of of the dog with the with. Um, and it reflected with blue sky in the back with a with mask on it. So um, I, I don't, I'm not, there, there's some collaboration here, maybe you work with friends. I don't know the whole party mail, the uh, the, the um, name tags. Um, again, art is subjective, take from it what you will. So um, pretty sweet, pretty sweet piece. She goes by Tribal Europe. Murals, and then she's also obviously a painter, but also has long for a couple of decades owns a tattoo and piercing studio called Soul Tribe. Um, so really cool piece um, there. Come back check it out. Right down this way, uh, piece. Uh, his Instagram is Detour Three Hundred Three. Um, totally worth following. He's all over the country. Awesome artist, Matt Evans, uh, this is Polonius Monk, uh, and uh, this replaced a previous detour piece, which replaced a previous detour piece. Uh, detour is notable. Uh, one of his most notable works lately is George Floyd um, on Colfax at High Street, and that's a east-facing um, wall. So that's worth checking out that he worked with Hero uh, Vega on that piece. So we will check out his website um, or follow him on Instagram. Awesome words here. Uh, Rhino Art Central Alley. Um, Rhino Art Alley is along here. That's the primary alley there. We have too big of a group to really to go back there. There's several new pieces back there. A couple of them. Uh, Austin T. Art is trying to head there. Actually not part of this year's crush, but he has work all over the place. He did the Healthcare Heroes, the first one on the female nurse with wings, that one, it's all over the place. Um, Hero Vega has an amazing, famous, fantastical work um, on the back of this one of these buildings here. Casey Kawaguchi has samurais throughout, really like one of the most e easiest artists to pick out, Casey Kawaguchi. Um, there was a great example at uh, 28th and Larimer on the wall that's um, along the alley. So we'll just uh, keep moving along here. There's Lindsay and somehow John. Um, and they obvious collaboration um john is uh let's see he's out at uh atlanta sensi but came out here to go to school in durango um he's been an artist here had a shop here before um and we just got in it sounds like he based on my basic understanding of, of john um he got into live painting shows Paint, uh, print, working with friends with like-minded productions, also a presence here in Rhino, um, painting and exhibiting. He paints and exhibits throughout the U.S., Caribbean, and, uh, and Europe. And uh, I think he collaborated with others to expand crush walls. He's secure walls for more than three dollars back in the day. So he has a long history here in the neighborhood. Uh, Lindsay Lenz is out of Cheyenne, Wyoming, or something like that. She grew up helping her father paint murals and was also inspired by her her mother's work as an executive, you know, in an office job, 
um, and something like that. She pursued a career in finance in Denver for 10 years. She was in the mortgage industry, 10 years in personal finance, and then uh, made a big leap uh, to to um, to art and and, and found uh, <laughs> Lamb. A bit of a legend here. Um, and my understanding is, so we have Dread here on the list. Pretty clearly two different styles. Dread here, he goes by, under, uh, his Instagram is underscore Dread God underscore, I think. And then we have Mike Ortiz, uh, also known as Ilson. Um, I think, I believe Dread, my understanding or reading of this is that he, he helped to create um, Crush um, over a decade ago. Um, he's, he's dedicated his entire life to the pursuit of finding meaning and direction through art. Um, beautiful piece here. Um, and, uh, and then we have Mike Ortiz. His work, this doesn't, maybe doesn't um, call back to you a little bit like the perspective going on here. Uh, can anyone recall the three pieces that are actually pretty similar style across from Denver Central Market on, on Larimer? Um, a guy that looks like he's in a thinking pose, but he's looking down at a deep perspective. I can see some of that, those elements here, but that's his work on three different panels. So next time you're on that block, Larimer, near Central Market, look across the way. I think it's the Volunteers of America warehouse building there. Um, but yeah, that's uh, Mike Ortiz um, or Ilson. Um, and I think that's his, Ilson, I think is his, his, his uh, um, Instagram. Uh, he focuses on, uh, it's my last bit of notes, and then we'll, I'll just have ad-lib notes in the next spot, so bear, bear with. Um, he focuses on large-scale indoor and outdoor artworks, uh, artworks with detailed conceptual compositions. His murals are vibrant, colorful, intentional. He has depth of experience engaging the public and uplifting communities around the U.S. and the world with his art. He creates imagery that can be interpreted and embraced by all audiences. Um, yeah, there you go. Cool. So um, I think one of the more interesting things is like finding his work here and then also relating it back to uh, previous existing work. Cool. Well, um, let's head out. Yo, hey, what's up? Um, so this is um, very much the same artist. Uh, two different goes on this. This is Austin Zeller. Sorry, Austin Zeller. Austin Zeller. Um, Austin Zucchini Fowler. That is hyphenated. Um, and uh, so that, but yeah, he has done a whole series. We probably, y'all have probably seen uh, some of the uh, some of the press for him. But again, I mentioned he had the healthcare hero um, on whatever Colfax and Williams, a building there, um, and then a uh, another um, an African American male nurse on Larimer and Thirty Fifth that we might. You may be able to see, but it's kind of covered with, uh, by Exto dining tents, outdoor dining tents. That was the second piece. This was one of his earlier pieces. There is a construction worker way up off of North Washington, like five miles north. Um, and then, uh, but certainly he's paying homage. The theme is paying homage to um, heroes, uh, everyday heroes, um, heroes of COVID, healthcare heroes, um, the food service heroes. There's another piece I pointed out that's in the Rhino Art Alley near Denver Central Market, and then another piece in um, a bicycle, a bike delivery guy, and a, a food service uh, person in um, Cherry Creek. So, so uh, those are good to check out. Um, find him on Instagram, Austin the Art. Uh, another note on, uh, uh, I forgot to mention at the outset, um, but uh, I, I think it's really important, super Instagrammable place, right? All over, there's cool art everywhere. You can, uh, take photos, have a friend take photos of you or selfies. Um, I think it's a really good practice to tag the artist with the, the Instagram and just attribute them. They may not ever see that, but it's just, I think, a really good practice to acknowledge the, the artist and, and their handiwork. So just a note there, uh, PSA. Um, Matt, what do you think we're doing on time? Are you thinking of... Okay, cool. Um, Claire, we need the mic. So, yeah. um, I do not know how to pronounce the artist's last name, Gina Il Ilsivis Zen. Um, uh, awesome work. She's a tattoo artist. 
um, artists on the side maybe I don't know but um, her, check out her Instagram if, if you can uh, tattoos by Gina I believe yeah to add tattoos by Gina um, some awesome work there of course I'll, I'll just see lots of great tattoos but yeah this is pretty, pretty phenomenal piece um, and we will keep moving on yeah so um, I pointed out for those that were kind of around me along Broadway Bridge underpass Sandra Fettingus. Fettingus, she had a piece that was much more ge geometric along the early part of Broadway Bridge underpass. And then Sandy, and she worked with Sandy Calistro. I don't have any, um, but very, very much different, very different styles there. Sandy's uh, contribution. Um, and, and Sandy's contribution. Truly they go together very well, very different individually, very different styles. Um, that's all I got. Um, leave reviews on Yelp. Um, <laughs> good luck spelling my name. Yay! For this next segment of the show, I did an interview on a podcast with my good friend Jordan Rosario. This podcast is entitled Keeping It 100. We spoke a little bit about David Attenborough's new movie spoke a little bit about environmentalism, politics, Black Lives Matter, and various subjects along the way. We will show you a little bit, a few segments from that show. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of Keeping It 100. This is Jordan Rosario, aka DJ Storytime, and I'm going to be joined here with my good friend, Drew, today. We're going to be talking about his life, his passion, his reason why he's going to be a filmmaker. We're going to get into uh, how we met. We're also going to be talking a little bit about the juice. And I'm not talking about orange, apple, cranberry, grapefruit, whatever juice you want to call it. I'm talking about the juice, the YouTube channel, the must-watch of this year for sure. And we're also going to get a little into a David Attenborough, A Life on Our Planet, one of the best Netflix documentaries that you're ever going to see in terms of if you are passionate about the environment. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Drew, yes. tell me a story. How has your weekend been treating you, my friend? Oh, uh, well, it's uh, been going well. Mostly, uh, you know, just trying to stay busy, and I've been uh, in my new place, so I've just been settling in. Just wanted to uh, relay back on that point. I mean, listen, if we do not, if we still continue that, uh, that mental mindset that we are apart from nature and not become a part of nature, I mean, you saw what the world, the world can look like in about 80 years. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is... All of the damage that we're talking about takes like hundreds of thousands of years to um, recreate. So I remember him saying, you know, usually, you know, he's talking about climate change and uh, the five great extinctions. And I remember him saying, you know, what we worry about with climate change is not just nature, but us as well. And that's where you really start to realize, like, we are an extension of nature. You know, I'm sure you noticed, like, um, you know, our diet <clears throat> all comes from other living things. All of our housing, you know, these are all supplies that at some point came from planet Earth, obviously. Obviously. So, and really, it's just, uh, it's kind of a how we use it um, and abuse it. So, I mean, nature is very delicate and can be tricky, but it really takes uh, just a slight move to destroy it. I'm sure you've been hiking on a trail in the mountains and you realize that trail is there. You know, just people walking in a straight line leaves a giant scar across the landscape. And, you know, that scar is definitely our, you know, bit of our impact. And, you know, that's why they say stay on the trail, because, you know, if there's only one scar, 
We can minimize damage if everyone was running wild across the entire landscape. Obviously, we'd ruin a whole bunch of we very cause a small. Lot more damage. Yeah. So, and I'm sure you know if you've ever been camping. You know, usually, if you're out in the wilderness, you know, obviously, you pick up your trash, uh, you dispose of it, and you try to leave your campsite just as clean as when you found it. And basically, it's kind of a similar practice. It's like, well, who just trashes their campsite, burns down all the trees, cuts down all the trees, like, it leaves just a huge mess. It's, like, really inappropriate and uh, can be considered offensive. So, but yeah, so I remember he talked a bit on uh, Chernobyl. That was his intro was piece. Like, yeah, that was the intro piece, yeah. And I think that was a heavy hitter. I, uh, you know, that definitely is a good example of environmental catastrophes. Because... A man-made disaster. Yeah. Well, obviously, you know, I thought it was very fascinating that... You know, obviously, uh, the explosion went off. There is leaked uh, nuclear radiation and waste, and everyone left to avoid uh, toxic radiation. And uh, so, and that was one of the only cases where there was giant exodus. And they just left a city, just ghost town. And it's fascinating to see, you know, them coming back and re-exploring because now there's just uh, overgrowth everywhere. And obviously not a single person lives in the city. And there's just animals and overgrowth. And it's pretty terrifying to think about that. And... You know, as climate change uh, continues to advance, we will see things like that. Um, obviously, uh, you know, you've heard of sea levels rising because mm -hmm. as uh, glacier melt off. Yeah, the Arctic the ice caps. I mean, they're they're melting like nobody's business now. Yeah, and. Obviously, that will leave, um, you know, cultures that are sea level. It'll put entire cities underwater. And how weird will that be someday to be riding around on a boat and potentially run into a skyscraper, an abandoned skyscraper in the middle of the ocean? Um, or have to go scuba diving to see an empty city that, hundreds of people used to inhabit so and it's really situations like that where it's drastic it's huge and you know I'm glad he brought up the five extinctions because there have been five mass extinctions on this planet before obviously you guys all probably have heard the dinosaurs <laughs> and none of them are around today you know obviously there's some of them resemble, like alligators resemble sort of a ancestor, but as far as we're concerned, they don't exist anymore. And that's a huge thing for an entire population of species to disappear. And by the way, the <laughs> dinosaurs were still living here. I don't believe us humans would be living here because I think... Uh, if I ever ran into a T-Rex, I'd be dead. Yeah. Well, they had a very different climate. Um, they had different oxygen levels, mm -hmm. different CO2 levels. So the Earth as we know it was not the same back then. They were living in a time that had raised oxygen levels, which caused a lot of the insects to be giant. There's giant insects like this big. And obviously, the dominant species were rep reptiles and rather overgrown reptiles, obviously. 
I mean, we've all seen Jurassic Park, so. Yeah. <laughs> Not that that's a completely accurate description, but. <laughs> Fantastic movie, by the way. Yeah. And obviously, you know, I believe it was a meteor that wiped them out. And obviously that pretty much took a huge chunk. And a lot of mammalian life, like rats, burrowed. They lived underneath the surface of the earth. Um, while there is ash raining um, around the planet, uh, massive amounts of carbon dioxide. Um, I believe there was a lot of volcanic activity, and so it was kind of like the forest fires. There was just a toxic amount of ash in the air, and sun wasn't able to get through, plant life was dying, and the rat population made it through because they would burrow themselves underground and they were able to avoid a lot of the toxic air quality and predation. And obviously, you know, as humans, we are mammals. We're warm-blooded, we're not reptiles. So obviously we have- We can't burrow into holes. Yeah. But you know, even, even still, we still resemble it. Like, you know, we're sitting in a house right now, which is sort of like a prairie dog burrow. Like obviously we've refined it and we're not just sitting in the dirt, but um, that's because we've, we've evolved to be a more intelligent species and we're self-aware. And, and listen, speaking of intelligence, speaking of self-aware, I mean, <laughs> when we look at, because I wanted to go back to the Juice YouTube channel, because you will elo so eloquently pointed this out, I mean... You've got people like Elon Musk that understand what's going on, what we could do to protect the environment. Welcome to the park. During this section, I will be discussing uh, my last week and I guess election season. Anyway, to start off, Many of you may have noticed that the show got postponed for about a month. Essentially what was going on there was I moved and uh, had a new set. And uh, I was busy moving, finding a new job. It was a hectic week. And then on top of all, my new roommate had a psychotic breakdown and uh, smashed all of my belongings which is really not good he uh, I don't know what his problem was but it uh, threw, threw the episode off by a few weeks because I couldn't set up all my camera equipment because he would threaten to break it so it's unfortunate however he is uh he actually is in jail right now basically he uh broke into the house smashed my stuff the landlord stuff the other roommate stuff and uh was an endangerment to himself and others and got arrested so anyway i had to move to a new place i'm at a new place now temporarily so this whole episode is going to be thrown off a little bit, but you know, whatever, we'll work with what we got. Hopefully I can find a stable living situation soon and a stable financial situation. I was uh, going to talk about, man, I was going to talk about a lot of things, but I think I was going to talk about slavery because we all know slavery hits a hard nerve in all of us and it's really inappropriate and really how did we fight slavery you know obviously it's pretty well known Lincoln freed the slaves in America over a hundred years ago and 
personally, it's hard for me to believe that we, America even had slavery, given it's all of the civil liberties we have for our citizens, and it's pretty hideous history. I think, and you know, what was really freeing the slaves is pretty much at some point it turned into paying people. So back in the day, you know, they would have people doing hard labor, mostly farm work, and they wouldn't get paid. And they weren't free to leave. So, I mean, it's a multitude of things. So now they're free to leave and they get paid. So, I mean, I guess that's what they mean for freeing the slaves. It's interesting because as humans, we run into this weird issue of resources and having enough people to pull things off. Because I'm not sure if you realize or if you've ever tried to build a house by yourself. At some point, you need help from other people. You can't... I mean, maybe there's been a few people that are talented that can do it, but... For the majority of people, you need help lifting and stacking all those materials. And you need, most people aren't expert architects, so you need architectural input, you need building materials, and then you need labor to assemble the materials. And you need it all done this century. I mean, if you try to design your house and get all the materials yourself and build it yourself, geez, I don't know, some sort of champion, but you're probably skipping a few building codes, uh, the house isn't going to be as nice, and it might take you like five or ten years to complete the project. So that's where having a whole crew of people speeds things along and you get a nicer product in the end. However, all that is very pricey and it comes at an expense. And if you don't have the expense ready, who knows how you're gonna pay them. So, and that's really true for anything. You know, housing is a big thing because most people on this planet live in houses, or at least in this country, in this specific climate. You know, if we had a much warmer climate, maybe living in a a palapa would be more suitable. But we have snow and wind and rain, and a palapa doesn't cut it. So, but also, you know, once you have that house, you need food. Like, you're going to grow your own food, too? Like, I don't know how people used to do it. Obviously, having an entire crew to help keep around, first off, makes the entire process go by faster and easier on everyone. So, and I do understand that. And then, it's I think it's the aspect of payment. Because it's like, all of a sudden, payment is secures slavery don't you know like if you get paid you're not a slave oh. so even if you wanted to do nice things like you're like oh yeah I'll, I'll help your help your buddy move or something you know he might not pay you but it's fine you know whatever you volunteered are volunteer slaves you know what I mean so and really a slave is someone that can't leave doesn't get paid and is under strict order from a superior and keep in mind these the slaves were forced they were they did not consent they were forced into it they were abused into it used violence against them and conditions were rather harsh and inhumane. So, but, 
So obviously we're all very glad that we don't have to deal with that. And I believe slavery around the world has been eradicated for the most part. I mean, as far as traditional hardcore slavery, now it's much sneakier and stealthier. And now it gets called different things. Which is almost like, okay, well, it's still around. We just need new terms and better ways to combat it. So, but at some point we all live in a society and we all need things done and we all need to help each other out. So, it's an interesting relationship between helping each other out and being forced and abused into helping someone. So, but... I think modern slavery is really when you're forced into something, which is really unfortunate sometimes because, you know, I'll talk about myself because I can talk about myself. You know, I like applying for jobs, sure. I have a prestigious degree from an accredited university. I use my education to do stuff like this. However, that doesn't mean I haven't worked some pretty lame jobs in the past. And it does suck being forced to stand there. And it's weird. I don't know. You know, it's when they pay you hourly. And it's like, okay, being paid hourly sometimes can be a good thing, sometimes not. Usually, you know, when I work for myself, sure, I might have sat here for an hour, but I didn't get paid for it. And I get paid for the final product. So it's interesting how they deviate up the cash because you know when you're selling let's say you're working I used to sell tacos I had a taco stand and uh, you know there used to be a long line out the door and there is always something so it's like how many tacos would this business sell in an hour and how much money did they owe the employee? So that's where they set a gray zone. We're like, okay, sort of a safety net, like in case there's no line and there's no people selling, buying tacos. It sets a safety net doing it hourly. But if you do pay by product, so if you were like, a business partner because the business they're there to make profit they're not necessarily there to make the best tacos around like maybe they are maybe they're just as obnoxiously passionate about their tacos but usually they're there to make a profit and what's their profit margin you know they break even once they sell enough tacos to pay the employees and whatever extra money that they made is profit obviously so that's where at, you work as an employee you agree to a set amount of money and you get exploited because at some point suppose you sold two thousand dollars worth of tacos in that hour but you only get paid 1250 you know what i mean the business broke even 400 tacos ago and you didn't get any of that extra money but suppose there's no one in line you still get $14 or 1250 whatever minimum wage is so and that's kind of a thing that businesses do to uh, stay afloat I guess because obviously if they paid their employees the amount of money that they sold they would 
have a hard time <laughs> continuing that business model. So I get it, you know, it's like everyone gets a piece of the pie, but at some point someone's getting exploited. And is it the boss that's getting exploited, the business owner that's getting exploited, the employee, or the customer? And it's not many people, it's very obviously the employee that's getting exploited. So, and that exploitation is really where the profit is. So they profit off of exploitation, which at some point resembles slavery. Because if you remember all those slaves, they didn't consent, they were being exploited. And that's where the riches are. Which I'm not entirely sure why exploiting other people leads to wealth. Very peculiar thing about our universe. But it's obviously not fair or equitable. But it's consensual. You consented to it. So I guess no one can really defend you. So it's a weird thing. Also Cash really only works when a government is enforcing it. Like we all have cash, you know, when I say cash or actually when you pay with cash, it says United States on it and it's enforced by the government. And if it wasn't enforced by the government, we really would have not many means of, I don't think many people would just accept your silly pieces of paper. So, but when a government enforces it and everyone abides by the same rules, it can work pretty well. So, and I don't know any country right now that doesn't use cash. So, it's pretty universal at this point.